Born of two worlds and rejected by both, a being of pain and anger, a reject. This is the story of Prince Namor of Atlantis, the Submariner. My name is Shaw, and welcome to Wit's End. To understand the avenging son of Atlantis, we need to talk about his creator, cartoonist Bill Everett. He was born May 18, 1917, as William Blake Everett in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There's a book I highly recommend. It's called Sparring with Gil Kane, published by Fantagraphics, and it has Gil Kane talking with or interviewing creators like Will Eisner, Stan Lee, Howard Chaikin, Robert Crumb, and of course, Bill Everett. The Bill Everett interview takes place during a 1970s comic book convention panel where Gil Kane and Bill Everett are up on stage talking to one another, getting questions from fans in the audience. And during this 1970 interview, Bill Everett explains how, quote, I was sort of led into cartooning by my father's wish. He always wanted me to be a cartoonist, and he died, unfortunately, before he saw that come true, unquote. Everett's parents were fully supportive of his artistic pursuits. According to that 1970 interview with Kane, Everett dropped out of high school and wanted to be a writer. Instead of reading pulps and comics, the young Everett read literature and the classics. He cites writer Jack London as his idol. Poet and painter William Blake was also a major influence on Bill Everett, and allegedly William Blake is Bill Everett's ancestor. While Everett didn't become a great novelist, he brought his writing strengths to his comic storytelling. According to Everett, he had been drawing his whole life. In that 1970 Gil Kane interview, Everett talks about how he only had two years of formal art training. Quote, I actually had two years of art training, and I really didn't have that. I was credited with two years of training because I got through three years in about a year and a half, and this was due only to an inborn talent and drive. I had to get somewhere fast. End quote. There's a primal power in all of Everett's work. His art only got better, more kinetic over the course of his career and life. During his career, Everett worked commercial advertising gigs. In 1939, Everett worked under Lloyd Jaquette's Comic Studios. It was here where Everett worked on characters like Amazing Man, Skyrocket Steel, and Dirk the Demon. Jaquette eventually started a new company called Funnies Inc. Companies like Funnies Inc. would be commissioned by comics publishers to create full comic stories on demand that were made for distribution by those publishers. It was at Funnies Inc. where Everett's most iconic character was born in the pages of Motion Picture Funnies Weekly number one, Namor the Submariner. Motion Picture Funnies Weekly was a freebie black and white promotional comic that was supposed to be handed out to kids in movie theaters. Only a few copies were sent out to movie theater owners, but the book was never published. It kind of died before it even got a chance to walk. However, one of Funnies Inc.'s clients was Martin Goodman, publisher and founder of Timely Comics, which would go on to be rebranded as Atlas in 1951 and eventually Marvel Comics in 1961. Funnies Inc. creators like Everett, Human Torch creator Carl Burgos, and other cartoonists supplied stories for Marvel Mystery Comics number one, or simply Marvel Comics number one, which was published in 1931. This was Timely's first printed publication and featured the first appearances of Everett's Submariner, Burgos's Human Torch, Paul Gustafson's Angel, and other characters like Kesar and the Masked Raider. Marvel Comics number one expanded on the original Funnies Weekly eight-page namer story by four extra pages. It featured a half-Atlantean, half-human mutant with a temper and resentment towards the surface people. What separated Everett's Prince of Atlantis from other superhero characters and comics at the time was that Namor wasn't actually a hero, more like the first comic book anti-hero. Where there was civilization, you can find Namor wreaking havoc as payback for the land dwellers' assault on Atlantis. You'd catch him destroying skyscrapers or boats or picking fights with soldiers. Anger was and still is a big part of Namor's character, a being of two wildly different worlds not fully accepted by either one. Quote, I am only recently beginning to learn that there was more to my writing of the Submariner than I actually thought at the time. He was an angry character, and I probably expressed some of my own personality. End quote. Here's a fun fact about the origin of Namor's name. Here's a quote from Everett when he answered a fan's question at that 1970 convention. And please don't ask me where I got the name Namor. It's Roman spelled backwards, but I have long since forgotten why I decided I wanted the name Roman. I did it for some reason, but I've forgotten what that reason was. 
Namor's allure isn't that he's a super-powered hybrid Atlantean brawler with wings on his ankles. It's that Namor has a strong sense of pathos, of humanity about him. Despite his fiery rage, Namor wore his heart on his sleeve, just like his creator. He wasn't vengeful for the sake of it. A character who's a dick or just good or bad for no reason isn't really interesting. There has to be a motivation behind it. Namor cares for his people, yet the fact that he's half human and half Atlantean means that he will never be fully accepted by either. Namor is an outsider. My favorite characters in fiction are loners and wanderers. Loner usually gets a bad rap, mostly because the general population isn't introspective enough and doesn't know how to use the word correctly. But Namor is a loner who wanders, looking for acceptance or purpose or his next adventure. His story is pretty human when you think about it, pretty relatable. Isn't this our constant struggle? Find acceptance or find purpose or find the next thing to keep us going. Another big difference with Namor is that, unlike other characters of the time, he's just not fixated on what's going on in his stories. He's not just fixated on the fictional world. Namor, throughout his history, even in the modern comics, has paid attention to what's going on in our world, whether it's World War II, Nazis, environmental problems, people dumping waste into Atlantis. Despite being half Atlantean and half human, Namor has been known to put his resentments of surface people aside to fight for a common cause. And what brings people together more than a war where you fight some Nazis? It was in Marvel Comics number 17 from 1941 that saw Namor teaming up with the Allies to fight Nazis who tried to invade America by building an underground tunnel. But he wasn't alone. Everett's Atlantean teamed up with Carl Burgos's high-flying android, the Human Torch. The original one, not the one from the Fantastic Four that showed up in 1961. Two different characters. While Namor and the Torch were enemies in the comics, Everett and Burgos were good friends and regular collaborators. Everett didn't just face the war in his comics. In 1942, he enlisted in the army. After that, Everett got married, had a kid, and eventually returned from fighting in the Pacific in 1946. Submariner was canceled in 1949 as interest in superheroes and wartime struggles started to wane. When timely rebranded to Atlas in the 50s, Namor was resurrected in the pages of Submariner Comics number 33 through 42. So Everett got to just continue his story and numbering where he had left it years before. By the 60s, it seemed Namor had hit the end of the line. Marvel was in full swing and Everett was working with Stan Lee on Daredevil. It was Lee and Jack Kirby who brought Namor back from obscurity and cancellation in the pages of Fantastic Four number 4. Everett returned to his creation in Tales to Astonish number 85 and 86 from 1966, and he returned as an artist in Tales to Astonish number 87 from 1967. Thing is, he did continue to work on his character consistently, but not as a writer and artist. He would ink Tales to Astonish stories. It wasn't until 1972 that Bill Everett would write and draw his creation with Submariner 50. I have to say, those 70s Namor stories are some of my favorite of Everett's work. Namor is angrier than he's ever been, and Everett is at the height of his talents. Sadly, Everett died in 1973 at the age of 55. He smoked throughout his life and had alcohol problems dating back to when he was a teenager and his body could not handle the stress. He died too young when he was at the top of his game. His last work was in Submariner number 61 from 1973. It's unreal that a creator would consistently work on his own creation throughout his career. There are characters who were created only to live short lives and be forgotten once they stop being circulated. But the thing is, Namor wasn't a one-note character, just like Everett wasn't a one-note creator. As Everett grew and developed, so did Namor. There were figures who wore their hearts on their sleeves and single-handedly influenced the direction of comics in a way few have. Here's to two princes. Chaos ensues.